to order. The time is 6.02 p.m. Mr. Sampson, was our uh, meeting properly posted? And do we have a quorum? Great. Uh, one announcement before we begin, Dr. O'Brien. Yes, President Clem, I just wanted to um, make mention of a special treat that the board experienced tonight. If you hadn't noticed by the poster it's on the wall that January is School Board Appreciation. January is School Board Appreciation Month, and we had the students from Stewart Career Tech High School provide a meal for the board this evening, and the students were Ohana Moore and Aleeson Summerall, and they were escorted by the two chefs, Tina Andrade and Kylie Sopcek, their teachers, and they had to leave quickly to go off uh, and prepare for a competition coming up, but we did want to send a shout out to them. My mic keeps cutting off and on, but we wanted to send a shout out to them for prep preparing that meal for us this evening and wish them the best of luck. And while I have your attention, we thought we would let you know that the Stewart Career Tech High School has an open table uh, called the Titan Table on Thursdays. You do have to go online to the district website and sign up to have lunch, but you would have a lunch uh, as prepared by our students in the culinary arts program at Stewart Career Tech High School. But a big shout out to them. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> and now I'll turn it over to Mr. Foxworth for opening exercises. Okay, good evening, President Clem, school board members, and Dr. O'Brien. We will begin the opening ceremonies with a prayer led by Mr. Howard Simpson. Everyone, please rise. Thank you, Mr. Sampson. The Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas Flag will be led by Sterling High School Class President Brock Glasscock. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now for the Texas Pledge. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you. Thank you, Brock. You may be seated. The Sterling High School Reverb Choir will be singing the song entitled Light of a Clear Blue Morning. Choir students performing are Alamet Amapas, Camila Blanco, Rahilio Chavez, Lauren Corret, Francisco Gonzalez, Kayla Hammett, Sarah Hilliard, William Hunt, Adrian Lopez, Jose Oquindo Velez, Anna Ruiz Ramos, Madeline Vivalta, and Joshua Villanueva. Students under the direction of mu music teacher Mr. Dylan Fornshell and principal Mr. Nathan Chaddick.
Thank you, Sterling High School Show Reverb Choir. Appreciate Do we it. have any parents or friends, family of the performers tonight with us? Would, would you stand to be recognized? Moms and dads, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, thank you for sharing their talents with us. Okay, in honor of school board appreciation, we have a proclamation from the city of Baytown led by Councilwoman Laura. Thank you for joining us, Councilwoman. <laughs> Good evening, board. Um, it's an honor to be here on this day. And, you know, our district um, is led by and governed by you, um, but it is also um, your staff and faculty that help you uh, govern. And so um, I'm just glad to be here, you know, product of Goose Creek to, to honor you and the work that you do each and every day. Um, so I'm here on behalf of city council and the mayor um, for a proclamation from the city of Baytown for school board recognition month. So whereas the mission of public schools is to meet the diverse educational needs of all children and to empower them to become competent, productive, contributors to a democratic society and an ever-changing world, and where else, whereas local school board members are committed to children and believe that all children can be successful learners and that the best education is tailored to the individual needs of the child. And whereas local school board members work closely with parents, educational professionals, and other community members to create the educational vision we want for our children. And whereas local school board members are responsible for ensuring the structure that provides a solid foundation for our school system. And whereas local school board members are strong advocates for public education and are responsible for communicating the needs of the school district to the public and the public's expectations to the district. Um, now, therefore, uh, on behalf of Mayor Brandon Capetillo, um, I do hereby uh, declare my appreciation to the members of the Goose Creek CISD School Board and proclaim January 2023 as School Board Recognition Month in the city of Baytown. I urge all citizens to join us in recognizing the dedication and hard work of local school board members and working with them to mold an education system that meets the needs of today and tomorrow's children. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Ms. Alvarado. Next, we have a presentation from Precinct 2 County Commissioner Community Liaison, Mrs. Gretchen Knowles. Well, good evening, everybody. How are you? Well, you know, I don't even know where to start <laughs> with, with this group. <laughs> uh, because several of you are my personal friends. I have an ex-boss that is on uh, the ISD. So I know I'm here representing Commissioner Garcia, but also personally, I, I think you all are the very best. And I'm proud that I, I'm a product of this, this district, went to high school with Carrie, <laughs> and 
yes, several of us. And uh, anyway, let me get to my, my script. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts of my job to represent commissioner to fabulous people like yourself. Harris County Precinct 2 Commissioner Adrian Garcia celebrates the outstanding Goose Creek Consolidated ISD board members during school board recognition month. Thank you. Thank each of you for your dedication and commitment to GCC ISD. As volunteer school board members perform the critical work, you're elected to guide the school district strategic plans, create budgets, adopt policies, working closely with Dr. O'Brien and the public. Your leadership and that hard work are critical to the success of our students. We recognize your commitment to children and the belief that all children can be successful learners and that the best education is tailored to the individuals of, of each child. Your collaborative work with educational professionals, parents, and other community members to create the educational vision of our students has led GCC ISD's great success in growing countless giants. I have two products of the school that are giants as well. <laughs> For all these reasons, Commissioner Garcia urges all citizens to join him in recognizing your dedication and hard work to meet needs of today's children and tomorrow's. Commissioner Garcia honors each of you with the Harris County Precinct 2 Certificate of Appreciation, acknowledging your unwavering leadership in public education and continuous service to the students of our community. So I have a certificate for each of you. Thank you, Mrs. Knoll. Appreciate you so much. Thank you. Okay, now I'd like to introduce, uh, welcome Ms. Sarah Flushi, Associate Director of English Language Arts and Foreign Language. Good evening. I'd like to join the others in honoring our board this evening. Goose Creek CS CISD would like to honor our 2022-2023 Board of Trustees for supporting our students, staff, and administration. We thank the Board of Trustees for their accomplishments and continuous efforts, and in recognition of your contributions, we'll place a book in your honor in each campus library. A list of titles selected by campus librarians is available for your review. Inside each book, we have affixed a label that reads, this book has been placed in honor of Goose Creek Consolidated Board of Trustees. In addition, you are each named along with your corresponding district. In addition, oh, sorry, finally, <laughs> again, thank you for all you do to support Goose Creek Giants. You are so appreciated. Thank you very much. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Now I'd like to introduce our Director of Community Engagement and Marketing, Mrs. Kendall David, to come on up. 
Good evening, President Clem, school board members, Dr. O'Brien. First of all, thank you, Councilwoman Laura Alvarado, for the proclamation in the board's honor and the certificate of appreciation from Precinct 2 Commissioner's Office, Adrian Garcia's office. Gretchen, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you to our librarians for selecting books in the board's honor and for the dinner provided by Chef Tina Andrade and student career tech high school students, culinary arts students. On behalf of Goose Creek CISD students, staff, and families, happy school board appreciation or recognition month. It is our honor to celebrate each of you and your dedication and commitment to the district and our students. This year's school, uh, school board recognition month is Forward Together. That's the theme and it highlights the collaboration among school leadership, teachers, and parents on behalf of students. To recognize our board, all 32 Goose Creek schools designed posters which decorate the walls here tonight depicting the theme. We hope you enjoy that. In addition, the district would like to present you with a plaque highlighting the monumental accomplishment of being selected as the 2022 Honor School Board as part of the 2022 Texas Association of School Administrators School Board Awards. This is an incredible accomplishment and only five school boards in the state of Texas achieve this each year. And this plaque will have a forever home in the boardroom and the superintendent's office so that your hard work and dedication will be remembered for decades. Thank you, Goose Creek CISD, our school board proudly known as the 2022 Honor School Board for your service to the district, students, staff, and parents. Ooh. Okay, thank you, Mrs. David. Next, we have our AP Scholar recognition. This will be led by our coordinator of advanced academics and special projects, Ms. Brandi Unkin. Good evening. Based on the 2022 advanced I'm sorry, I need to my glasses on. Based on the 2022 Advanced Placement Exam Administration, 65 Goose Creek CS CISD students were named AP Scholars. Earning this designation of AP Scholar is a huge accomplishment. Let's give all 65 of these students a big round of applause. <laughs> the College Board recognizes several levels of achievement based on the number of AP exams taken and scores achieved. The levels of achievement that we will be recognizing tonight are AP Scholar, AP Scholar with Honor, and AP Scholar with Distinction. Our academic deans from each high school will be introducing the students. Academic deans are Dr. Amanda James from Goose Creek Memorial High School, Ms. Kim Mitchell from Robert E. Lee High School, 
and in place of Ms. Lori Yarbrough, Jonathan Kirksey, Assistant Principal from Ross S. Sterling. The principals from each, high, each of these high schools are Ms. Kathy Holland from Goose Creek Memorial, Mr. Nathan Chaddock of Ross S. Sterling, who couldn't be in attendance tonight, and Mr. James Gray of Robert E. Lee High School. We will only be recognizing the students who were able to be with us tonight or the parents who are here to accept the plaque on the behalf of their child. Some of the students who are present with us tonight are attending various colleges and universities, so we're really happy to welcome them back to the district. Students, when your name is called, please come forward for an individual picture and then remain at the front for a group picture. Parents and guardians, as well as family members, please stand when your student's name is called. We'll be Begin by announcing the level of achievement termed AP Scholar. During the 21-22 school year, 46 students throughout the district qualified for the AP Scholar Award by completing three or more AP exams with the three or higher. The AP Scholars from Goose Creek Memorial High School who are present tonight are Swam Gupta. Swam is a junior and is not sure where he will attend college. He scored a three or higher on three exams. Swam is the son of Balkrinsha and Honey Gupta. <laughs> Let's give our GCM AP scholars who could be with us tonight another big round of applause. We'll take pictures of this group. AP scholars from Lee High School who are present tonight are Rebecca Archibald. Rebecca is attending the University of St. Thomas, majoring in psychology. She scored three or higher on seven exams. Rebecca is the daughter of Robert and Stacy Archibald. <laughs> Lemnia Green. Lemnia is attending Stephen F. Austin University, majoring in dance education. She scored three or higher on three exams. Lemnia is the daughter of Angelica and Lynn Thomas. <laughs> Dahlia Ruiz. Dahlia is a senior and plans on attending Lamar University with a major in environmental science. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Dahlia is the daughter of Roman Ruiz and Anna Maria Ruiz. <laughs> Jose Trujillo. Jose is attending Lee College, majoring in engineering. He scored a, a three or higher on three exams. Jose is the son of Jose and Guillermina Trujillo. Let's give our REL AP scholars who could be with us tonight another big round of applause. The AP scholars from Sterling High School who are present tonight are Evan Butler. Evan is a senior and plans on attending Texas A&M University with a major in biological and agricultural engineering. He scored a three or higher on five exams. Evan is the son of Crystal Butler and Joel Butler. <laughs> Caitlin Davis. Caitlin is attending Sam Houston State University, majoring in biology. She scored a three or higher on three exams. She is the daughter of Pam and Shannon Davis. Brock Glasscock. Brock is a senior and plans on attending Rice University or Texas A&M, majoring in engineering. He scored a three or higher on five exams. Brock is the son of James and Amy Glasscock. <laughs> Briley Holloman. Briley is a senior and is undecided on what college she is attending, but plans on majoring in biology for pre-med. 
She scored a three or higher on three exams. Riley is the daughter of Cynthia Harrelson. <laughs> Helena Jones. Helena is a senior and plans on attending Texas A&M University with a major in animal science. She scored a three or higher on three exams. Helena is the daughter of Michael Jones. <laughs> Anne Wynn. She is a, Anne is a senior and plans on attending the University of Texas with a major in neuroscience. She scored a three or higher on five exams. Anne is the daughter of Ty Wynn and Davis Wynn. <laughs> Cassie Rogers. Cassie is a senior and plans on attending Texas A&M University majoring in neuroscience, molecular, and cellular. She scored a three or higher on six exams. Cassie is the daughter of Ken and Shannon Rogers. <laughs> Damaris Cifuentes. Damaris is a senior and plans on attending the University of St. Thomas with a major in business slash accounting. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Damaris is the daughter of Juan Cifuentes and Christy Seymour. Let's give our RSS AP scholars who are with us tonight another big round of applause. We'll take pictures of this group. Give our AP scholars another round of applause. Thank you. Eight students throughout the district qualified for the AP Scholar with Honor Award by earning an average score of at least 3.25 on all AP exams taken and grades of three or higher on four or more of these exams. The AP Scholars with Honor from GCM Memorial who are present tonight are Orlando Rangel Morales. Orlando is attending University of Texas, majoring in engineering. He scored a three or higher on four exams. Orlando is the son of Norma and Orlando Morales. The AP scholars with honor from Lee High School who are present tonight are Gisela Garcia. Gisela is a junior and plans on attending Lee College, majoring in forensic science or linguistics. She scored a three or higher on four exams. Gisela is the daughter of Rosa Garcia and Jose Miguel Garcia. Jean-Luc Poulon. Jean-Luc is attending Texas A&M Commerce with a major in music education. He scored a three or higher on 10 exams. Jean-Luc is the son of Robert and Amanda Poulon. AP scholars with honor from Sterling High School who are present tonight are Dahlia Cifuentes. Dahlia is attending the University of St. Thomas majoring in nursing. She scored a three or higher on eight exams. Dahlia is the daughter of Juan Cifuentes and Christy Seymour.
Let's give our AP scholars with, scholars with honors another applause. Thank you. 11 students throughout the district qualified for the AP Scholar with Distinction Award by earning an average score of at least 3.5 on all AP exams taken and scores of three or higher on five or more of these exams. The AP Scholars with Distinction from Goose Creek Memorial who are present are Hirsch Agarwal. Hirsch is a senior and plans on attending University of Texas with a major in electrical and computer engineering. He scored a three or higher on eight exams. Hirsch is the son of Garish and Anjun Agarwal. Aaron Sood. Aaron is a senior and plans on attending University of Texas with a major in computer engineering. He scored a three or higher on seven exams. Aaron is the son of Sanjay Sood and Vaninda Sood. Additionally, Aaron is a National Merit Semifinalist. Aaron Sood earned PSAT Semifinalist status for his PSAT score of 1480 during his junior year. He was among the top 16,000 students worldwide who earned the National Merit Semifinalist title. As a semifinalist, Aaron submitted an essay explaining his high school involvement, including advanced courses, extracurricular activities, and community support. Using high school coursework, teacher recommendations, the essay, and, and an SAT score, 15,000 finalists will be chosen to advance to the scholarship award round. Of the 15,000 finalists, 7,500 students worldwide will receive scholarships. Aaron scored a 1530 out of 1600 on his SAT for the finalist round. Finalists will be announced in February. Congratulations, Aaron. Goose Creek Memorial High School and the entire district are extremely proud of you. You truly show the world that here we grow giants. The AP scholars with distinction from Lee High School who are present tonight are Cannon Cockrell. Cannon is a senior and is undecided on which college to attend, but plans on majoring in computer science. He scored a three or higher on five exams. Cannon is the son of Gigi and Cody Cockrell. Corinna Levy. Corinna is a senior and is undecided on which college to attend, but plans on majoring in engineering. She scored a three or higher on six exams. Corinna is the daughter of Dr. Mary Hewitt and David Levy. Let's give our AP Scholars with Distinctions another applause. <laughs> AP teachers and counselors dedicate many hours of their lives towards the success of these students. Some of our AP teachers and counselors may be here tonight. If you were an AP teacher or counselor of one of these students, please stand so you may be recognized or principals. Again, if you are a family member of one of these students, please stand so that you may be recognized as well. Let's give them a round of applause. Parents. Congratulations to all of our AP scholars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Onken. Now we have uh, Ms. Roxanne Wyatt, our Director of Career and Technical Education, coming up. Good evening, President Clem.
Good evening, President Clem, Dr. O'Brien, Board of Trustees. Thank you for having us tonight. Tonight, we'd like to recognize some students that are with us, as well as teachers, who achieved superior honors at the Texas State FFA Convention this summer. Each student being recognized tonight has earned their Lone Star degree. So we'd like to congratulate them on their accomplishments. First up, we have Callie Moeller, who is a current senior at GCM, who earned her Lone Star degree. And the teacher with GCM tonight is Chris McLaren. From Ross S. Sterling, we have Helena Jones, a current senior who also received her Lone Star. All right, teachers with us tonight are Rebecca Banks, Ashley Lott, and Donald Guillory. And we have our 23, uh, sorry, 22 graduate, Caitlin Davis from Sterling, also obtained her Lone Star degree. Yes. I was trying to let them get individual pictures. Thank you. Okay, thank you students and thank you Mrs. Wyatt. Next we have Ms. Kennington, our Healthy Community Schools Coordinator along with Again, Ms. Laura, Councilwoman Laura Alvarado presenting on It's Time, Texas. It's time again. Um, good evening, school board members, Dr. O'Brien, and guests in the audience. I'm Amanda Kennington, the GCCISD Healthy Community School Coordinator, and joining me here at the podium is City of Baytown Council member, you've already spoken with today, Laura Alvarado. In the audience, there are representatives from MD Anderson, Mr. Terrence Adams, and the GCCISD School Health Advisory Council. We have our co-chair um, parent, Mr. David Reed, and Sam Chaffa, who is a SHAC member and a GCCISD employee. As you know, Goose Creek CISD is a proud and active member of Do Well Baytown, a community-wide initiative of MD Anderson sponsored by ExxonMobil. Do Well Baytown strives to promote wellness and stop cancer before it starts, and our school district is one of the key organizations in our community that is leading the work with the goal to provide strategies that generate positive, long-lasting changes in people's lives. With a new year comes new challenges, and with that, new goals. We're here to introduce our district's participation in the 2023 It's Time Texas Community Challenge. We're requesting your support and leadership, not only as school board members, but also as community leaders who are dedicated to our mission statement of developing the whole child. The challenge begins today, January 9th, and ends March 5th. The Community Challenge is a free statewide competition inspiring individuals, employers, cities, and schools across Texas to unite and engage in, a healthy, in healthy activities which leads to healthy communities. Start by registering online at ittcommunitychallenge.com 
you sign up on behalf of your city and school district to earn points for your community. You can also next download the ITT Community Challenge app on your phone or device and log healthy actions to earn points for every healthy action that you submit. Healthy actions such as working out, drinking water, eating a healthy meal, and even taking, even taking your dog for a walk can earn points if you log it in the app. Weekly prizes are offered to all participants and at the end of the eight week challenge, the cities and school districts with the most points in each size category get a cash prize to put toward a community health project. You may also recall that in 2022, Blue Street CISD came in second place in our category in the entire state. But did you know that the person who logged the most points in the entire city of Baytown was a GCC employee? The com competition is on, so it's on now to see who will earn the top spot in the year 2023. It's time Texas Community Challenge. Ms. Alvarado? Ms. Kenny, Kim, before Ms. Alvarado, I just wanted to ask, uh, if our board were to uh, do push-ups, sit-ups, and jumping jacks tonight <laughs> before the audience, does that count as anything? Yes, sir. I object. Back and forth, so. I know. <laughs> That's what I was going to add as well. Thank you so much for having me back up and log more stuff on my Fitbit. <laughs> um, so thank you, Amanda. Um, so even more than the competition, uh, It's Time Texas Community, Ca uh, Community Challenge is about encouraging each other um, to lead healthier lives and build a stronger, more connected community. Now the city recognizes that a healthy community is more united, productive, and prosperous, and that's why we pledge to spread the word and encourage community members to participate and be health champions. Now I have already taken my pledge and invite all of you to join me to be stronger together. And by the way, the city will have their um, kickoff on January the 26th. So if anybody wants to join us there at 6.30 p.m. and also log more points, you're more than welcome to come. So we recognize that schools cannot do this alone and appreciate the collaboration with the city and our community collaboratives also to ensure that we build a school community where our children feel safe, engaged, supported, challenged, and healthy. School board members, if you're willing to commit to a healthy living in Goose Creek CISD, Please register online for the 2023 Community Challenge, download the app, and share the opportunities with others in your community. Yes, the QR code on there. If you're willing to declare your support, please join me for a group photo here at the front. We have proof.
Um, we will now move to uh, agenda item number four is a public hearing on school first uh, report for fiscal year 2020-2021. We have Leanna Dixon, Pauline Cedeno, and Bridget Clark will be presenting this evening our public hearing. And just a reminder to the audience, a public hearing is just that. If you do have questions during, throughout, or at the end of the presentation, you may ask them. Okay, good evening, Board of Trustees, President Clem and Dr. O'Brien. Tonight, as a matter of uh, statute requirement, we are providing you the public hearing for the Financial Integrity Rating System of Texas, better known as the FIRST report. And um, if you look at the report itself and you say it looks familiar from last year, it's because it's almost identical in, in terms of rating score and the same criteria that we may not have scored 100% on. Um, it's the same ones. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leanna Dixon, our newly appointed Director of Finance. And we have here for support Pauline Sedano, our newly appointed Associate Director of Finance. So congratulations to them. Take it away, Leanne. Thank you. Good evening, President Clem, Board of Trustees, Superintendent O'Brien, and guests. We are required to publish notice in the newspaper and hold a public hearing on the district's first report, Financial Integrity, integrity Rating Report. I'm going to uh, go through the first skip through the first two slides since it's just history and you've heard this information before. And just to note the objective of the first report um, public hearing is to assess and evaluate the quality of financial management decisions and report these results to the general public. And there are 20 indicators. Five of those indicators are critical indicators which are a pass or fail. If we did not meet these uh, indicators, we would not receive a rating for the first report. And then six are ceiling indicators. Uh, ceiling indicators set a maximum number of points the district can receive if the criteria is not met. You can see that here in this chart. This is just a summary of the available ratings. And then we'll get into the critical indicators. Indicator number one, did the district file the annual audit report with TA on time? And yes, we submitted that report on November 24th, 2021. Was there an unmodified or clean opinion of the audit report by the auditors? Um, an un unmodified opinion provides a high level of assurance given by the external auditor that the examination of financial statements did not reveal any actual or possible misrepresentation or material weaknesses of the statements. Um, and we received an un unmodified opinion. Indicator number three, has the district timely paid all bills and obligations, including financial arrangements? And yes, the district did not default on any payments. Indicator four, did the school district make timely payments to teachers' retirement? Texas Workforce Commission or the Internal Revenue Services and other governmental agencies. And yes, we received, um, we passed this indicator. We received, uh, we paid all our payments on time. This is a ceiling indicator. So if we did not meet this criteria, the highest points we could receive was 95. And number five is an indicator that is not currently being um, scored by the state due to GASBI. The Governmental Accounting Standards Board. Now on to the solvency indicators. We have indicator number six, which me measures the percentage of change in fund balance and if the fund balance is declining too quickly. We did pass this indicator. Indicator seven measures how many days after the fiscal year end can the district cover operating expenditures, which is paying vendors and employees without receiving any new revenue. We received the full 10 points. The district had approximately 231 days of cash on hand. In 
indicator number eight measures whether the district has sufficient short-term assets to cover its short-term liabilities, and we received the full 10 points on this indicator. Number nine is simply asking if the district spent more than we have earned or whether our cash on hand exceeded 60 days. And again, we received full points because the district had 231 days of cash on hand. Indicator number 10, this indicator measures how accurately the district projects revenues comparing budget revenues submitted through PEANS in October to actual revenues submitted through the annual financial report. TA decided this year not to score this rating due to COVID-19, but if the indicator was being scored, the district would have received all 10 points. Sorry. Indicator number 11 measures our long-term liabilities to total assets. The district's debt is 67.24% of its total assets. To achieve all 10 points, we would have to be less than 60%, so we received eight of those 10 points. And it is another way to receive full 10 points is if the membership of student enrollment over the past five years was 7% or more, and you can see we were at 2.43%. Indicator number 12 is asking about the district's ability to make debt, principal, and interest payments that will become due during the year. Our coverage was sufficient, slightly a little higher, so we received eight of the 10 points. Number 13 measures the percentage of budget spent on administration. Again, we received eight of the 10 points. Our percentage was 8.57%, and the threshold is 8.55. Number 14, this indicator measures our PEANS data to our annual audit, expecting variances to be less than 3%. We received the full 10 points. Indicator number 15 measures how well the district is able to project average daily attendance compared to actual, and due to statewide fluctuations with ADA during the COVID-19 pandemic, TA has decided not to score this indicator. Indicator 16 measures our PEANS data to our annual audit, and again, that's the zero variance that we received. We passed that ceiling indicator. Number 17 is asking if there's any material weaknesses in the district's internal controls reported by the external auditor. There were no material weaknesses. We did pass this indicator. This is a ceiling indicator, so in the event the district failed, the maximum points we could have received would have been 79 points. Number 18 measures whether the district complies with laws, rules, and regulations related to expenditures of grant funds, contracts, and other state and federal funds. We received all the 10 points on this indicator as well. Number 19 measures whether the district complies with legal requirements related to financial transparency by posting all required information. We received full points. And number 20 is asking whether the board discussed property tax value and the impact on the district's financial budget. This information was discussed. We received, we passed this indicator. This one is another ceiling indicator, and 89 points would have been the maximum if we wouldn't have met that. So how well did the district do? Out of 100 points, we received 94 points, which is the superior achievement, which is the highest achievement you can receive. Any questions? All right, and reminder, since this is a public hearing, anyone could ask a question at this time? Yes, sir. Thank you.
Thank you for your question. The answer is it depends. It depends on what our values are, and it depends on what we have to – I mean, we aren't adding any more debt unless we move forward with either a bond election in the coming months or years and or a TRE election. But we have been very fortunate in that we have had very good financial advisors and bond counsel in advising us, and we're positioned very well in order – and also with our industrial partners and our commercial partners. We've experienced significant INS gains on our property values, and so that's able to sustain us in revenue and the ability to make our debt service payments. So as far as the actual ratio, that's dependent upon values. Not right now, but very soon we'll have projections again for this budget season that we're ramping up in right now. So you'll start seeing a lot more – you'll have to hear a lot more from me, unfortunately. But we'll be having a lot of budget conversations with revenue projections and the like. Thank you. Yeah, we barely missed that 10 points. I mean, just a hair, it was what – it was .55, and we had .57. So a lot of times the way districts categorize their administrative costs, it just is a difference in philosophy in the way they categorize those. So we're going to drill down into those numbers and make sure that we're aligned with other districts in the way they do it so we're comparable. Also, we did add a lot of support for campuses, and some of those are sometimes considered to be administrative. But almost all that we added were direct support of campuses. So – No, that's just how it's collected centrally by TEA. I mean, it's not audited. I mean, there's no – I mean, yeah, there's best practices, and there are ways you should based on the jobs, but there are so many different jobs that you can't compare exactly from district to district because, you know, in one district they may have, you know, those same responsibilities, but they may have a portion of their salary or duties dedicated to other responsibilities that wouldn't line up with, you know, a different district. So it's a good benchmark, but you do have to drill down into the numbers just to see what the differences are because it doesn't line up exactly just because every district is different and organized differently. We will get into all of that during our budget as we're ramping up the budget for this – the rest of this spring semester. So, yeah, we'll be doing a lot of talking. We do have public board workshops that are scheduled on the calendar for the spring semester. And I think you touched on this, Ms. Clark, but we did open up four new campuses within the last couple of years. So when you're opening up new campuses, you don't want to be understaffed. So that accounts for a little bit of that administrative weight. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? Our board members? All right. Thank you, ladies. And I'll declare the public hearing closed. Ms. Garcia, is there any public speakers tonight? All right. Then we'll move to item six, approval of minutes. I would seek a motion concerning the December 12th regular board meeting minutes. I'll move to approve. Second. 
have a motion from Ms. Guy and a second from Mr. Renteria to approve the December 12, 2022 board meeting minutes as written. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Abstain? 5-4-1 uh, abstention, motion passes. Uh, discussion items, superintendent reports, Dr. O'Brien. Yes, good evening. The superintendent's report this evening we'll hear are the 22-23 Goose Creek CISD District Improvement Plan and Campus Improvement Plans from Ms. Ginger McKay, and then we'll follow that up with special education update uh, from Christina Ritter and Holly Ferris, and then uh, the third superintendent report will be facility needs. I'll bring it Garcia and her team. CIPs and the DIP were made available to y'all to review and see if there was any questions you might have. I think if you do, I'll be happy to try to answer those or I'll take note and get back with you. About These are those. the guiding documents for this school year, right? Yes, sir. So why are we just seeing them in January? We uh, were going to have them in the November <coughs> meeting back in the fall and um, the agendas were set and there was not a if they're the guiding documents for this school year, why don't we see them in July or August? Well, we actually usually have them in September uh -huh. or October because the principals get to come back in August and meet with their ILTs to make sure that they are prepared and ready to be adopted and, and reviewed. And uh, they were um, asked to be uh, placed on the January meeting, and so that's what we did. And who asked that? I, I missed something I think something the superintendent in can answer that question. I would, okay. I would say that uh, Mr. Bollinger assists us with managing the superintendent's reports, and our attempt is to never have more than three. And uh, the fall semester, we had at least, I think, two or three every single meeting, and um, there was a meeting or two that were scheduled for four, and those ones that had four asked to get bumped. So okay. I can't so speak specifically to this report. Are these just unimportant documents that we're playing lip service to? or are they truly guiding documents for each campus and the district to improve by? And did we get those in September? Okay. Well, I, I just, I, I'm very uncomfortable reviewing Unless I read all six or 800 pages, I had no earthly idea what's going on until January. Well, actually, I didn't read all six or 800 pages. <laughs> yeah, but th this is something that we need to be seeing to make sure we agree that these are the guiding principles of what's going on on our campuses. So and so I would thanks. add to her statement that the principals still have to go through a process during the fall like they did in November to review with their staff to see the progress. And they have to uh, decide if they've met it or they have 20%. So that's, we have those have all been completed. Okay, thank you. Yes. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much. Just one note, um, Ms. Jackson, that final document arrives. We get preliminary in July. But the final document is the last week in August, is that right? Our first week in September? Y'all can come on up, ladies. Probably because of the question types, with all of the short answer and open-ended questions, it's going to take longer to score the the test than just a straight multiple choice. So 
lot of stuff to do. Welcome. You're on. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening, President Clem, Board, Dr. O'Brien. So we're here to give the special education update. I'm Holly Ferris, Senior Director of Special Programs. Christina Ritter, Director of Special Education. And so we're gonna start tonight with looking at our numbers over the past five years. As you can see here, we've had a significant increase in the amount of students in special education, especially since COVID. Over a thousand students now have qualified um, over the last three years, really. So why is there such an increase in special education? The number one reason is in 2018, OSEP issued a letter to TEA in the entire state of Texas, had to pivot and now offer a dyslexia evaluation through special education. Second, after COVID, we are seeing continued learning gaps with children, and those children are being referred for some additional um, evaluations as well. With the changes in dyslexia, we are seeing more students serve for dyslexia services through special education than 504. Autism, the last year in the state of Texas, overtook other health impairment and it became the third disability in the estate. Goose Creek is also seeing huge increases in the number of students qualifying under that label. And behavior as well has be, is a challenge all across the state. So here is a look at our evaluations that were um, our uh, staff have conducted as of like the 1st of November. And if you notice here, some of our campuses, especially on the north side, that's where we're seeing a lot of growth, but also a lot of our students that are um, being referred that are qualifying for special education. So we are also seeing an increase in our DNQ rate. That means they do not qualify for services. Um, in the past few years, we've seen a three to 5%, um, and, and we are seeing higher numbers of kids not qualifying where who might possibly still have learning gaps, but autism is at 19%. That is right in alignment with the state. The same when you see a specific learning disability, about 30% of our students being referred qualify, um, and that's where students will also qualify for dyslexia, along with the speech impairment. So as we look at our primary disability increases, um, the five most common disabilities are here autism, dyslexia, emotionally disturbed, specific learning disability, and speech. So as you can see here, we have significant increases in all of those areas. So some of the things that we've implemented to help with this increase in um, our students is we've started Saturday testing, one um, Saturday a month. Our evaluators come in if they would like, and we pay them to come in and work and test our students. Um, during fall break, both last year and this school year, we have um, taken two days, and they've, we've allowed them to come in and test students on those two days. And we've actually had a lot of uh, parents very receptive of that. Christmas break as well, we tested on December the 19th and 20th. And overall, when we ended for Christmas break, we had um, 415 evaluations for special ed that had been conducted this school year. That's the highest so far. So we still have 289 students in the referral status, and that is either through campus referrals, parent referrals, or child find. So once a child qualifies for special education, in addition to the evaluators um, doing, completing the evaluations for initial evaluations, then you have to look at an evaluation, a reevaluation every three years. So about a third of our population, so if you have 3,700 students in special ed, the evaluators are also conducting a reevaluation of 1,233. That's quite a lot as well. So what are some things that we've done over the last year for special education? So we have hired two additional instructional specialists um, to help with our instruction at the campus levels. And then we also were awarded a grant with Deer Park and LaPorte ISD. 
um, for autism. So we are implementing the STAR and LINX um, aut autism curriculum this school year. Along with, we were awarded two robots, which is very innovative. You can see Milo on the slide. So Milo and Carver, we are implementing in our focus programs at elementary, and we're seeing good response with both of those curriculums. So we also have been um, working with Fueling Brains to provide our ECSE, which is our early childhood special education four-year-old and three-year-old um, classrooms with behavior training. Um, we've really seen an increase in behavior and the need for that. We also were able to fund three diagnosticians due to you know, the need from all the dyslexia referrals through our House Bill 3 funds, which from our dyslexia allotment. Some other changes that we have, um, that have taken place this school year, we really looked last year at some of our um, areas where we needed to basically add programs and we took some PCNs that were not being used and reallocated that. So we added one ECSE for this school year, four silk classrooms, four life skills, four behavior classrooms, and eight elementary resource classrooms. And so with that, we um, looked at where they would go best in the district and where we had room. And then we also um, took over 450 students and placed them at appropriately at the, their home campus or the campus closest to where they lived based off of their disability and the program they needed. So helping our district save money. According to Mr. Walter Scheid, our Director of Transportation, if he has to bus a kid, it's about $30,000 across the district over a year's time. So. We really revamped that and um, we moved over 450 kids within the district for this school year. So what are some of the training and measures that we have implemented to assist the campuses? We have weekly referral meetings, so our campuses um, send their referrals in. We have our administrators log on and talk about those students so that we know that they have really implemented everything that they can at the campus level. We have um, had WebEx trainings on the referral process and best practices for our campuses. And the, every Wednesday we meet for those referrals and go over those folders and, and the information there. We've also looked at our MTSS uh, processes, which that used to be called the RTI model. And so we've collaborated curriculum, student wellness, and intervention together to revamp that and restructure that as well. We've had MDR training. We had David Hodgins from Thompson and Horton come in and train our APs and our SSAs on how to handle MDRs with students with disabilities. And behavior. And behavior. And then Fueling Brains, they've also been working with selected campuses. So we looked at our data and we identified those campuses that had the most referrals for discipline last year. And those principals selected teachers that may have been struggling to work so that um, Fueling Brains could work with those teachers in those classrooms. And so those are on here as well. And they've provided trainings, observations, and feedback. So this is a list of our current vacancies. And across the state, there is um, a, a need for additional evaluators. There's a shortage out there. So we currently have three art facilitator positions. If we filled those positions, we would be pulling teachers from campuses, and we really don't want to do that right now. Um, we already have teacher vacancies right now. Um, we are Shy One Board Certified Behavior Analyst, and they primarily work in the area of autism and with behavior. Um, and we have one BCBA right now, but we really need a second one. Um, two diagnostician openings, two LSSP openings, that's licensed specialist in school psychology, one speech language pathologist opening, and one speech language pathologist assistant. In addition to that, we have one assistive technology specialist open, one behavior specialist, and one transition specialist. Well, actually, the one tonight that we are taking to the board is going to replace someone who's retiring in January, so we will continue to have two openings. Great question. So some celebrations for our special education department. Um, with our results-driven accountability, we were um, a level two this year, so we improved. We were a level three last year, so we were very excited about that. 
indicators 11 and 12 were at 100 percent so the indicators uh, um, indicator 11 is timely initial evaluations so last school year for the entire school year um, our staff conducted 735 evaluations so you see we're already at 415 for this school year um, and then for our state performance indicator 12 early childhood transition um, students identified with an IEP by age three we did 36 um, evaluations and we were at hundred percent and we've already completed 30 this school year just so you know and also these pictures here these are our, some of our Special Olympics students at the state flag football um, tournament so we thought that that's a great celebration as well they made it to the state flag fo football competition so that was the first weekend I believe of December so any questions children uh, in special education our services have we seen an increase you said you have an increase of students but have we been able to serve those students and uh, provide the services as they come in and being evaluated and and what percentage of those students have we been able to serve of the numbers I, I think here uh, we had like 289 students in the referral status and so of those students in that referral status have we been able to uh, serve them? Well, we can't serve them till, act till after we have a, um, we, they're evaluated and they meet Texas education guidelines. Mm -hmm. And then our committee determines that there's an educational need for services. And some parents either sign consent for services or they decline consent. So once we, they accept and, and um, fill, out the fill out the consent for services, then we can provide those services. So are you talking about maybe um, services through MTSS wh and while they're yep. waiting to be Sorry, evaluated? Um, what does that mean on the MT, the acronym that you say? The multi-tiered systems oh, okay, of gotcha. support. Okay. Campuses are usually putting it, I mean, we when we have a referral meetings, mm -hmm. we have 504 and special ed there. So if we have a child who is struggling, we may place them in 504 while we're waiting for them to be evaluated for special ed so that they can at least receive some accommodations. So it, it's, a, it's really a multi- But they are receiving a service, but they may be in this whole Maybe through 504, yes, okay, ma'am. Gotcha. That was her question. I think you, the other answer to that is that out of the 289, 300, let's say, 200 do not qualify ultimately based upon our current ratio. So the biggest concern would be that 100 what are we doing to help them while they're in the queue? And you answered it with yeah. saying mm -hmm. we're uh, mm -hmm. accommodating with 504 accommodations sure. for what we think they might need right. prior to understanding what the assessment tells us, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. We're trying to put interventions in place, and that's great, great evaluation data that we need as well. Just wanted to make sure how we were serving those that were right. in the holding pattern. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Quickly, uh, guide me through the entire process from somebody on the campus level saying, I think Johnny needs extra help. Where do we, how does it start and how long does it take them to get to your committee? So normally they would start with the MTSS and start having interventions at the so campus level. So that's tier level. one, tier that's, two yes. interventions. Okay. Yes. And then depending on and if that, they have I'm sorry, a, that's a campus decision? Yes. Okay. And then if they have a suspected disability, we might qualify them under 504 to receive some accommodations. Um, and is that easier to qualify for than yes. SPED? Yes. Why? Um, SPED is very specific, and the there's um, formative testing where under 504 it's very informal. We just have to have to have something suspected. Does so let's say if we have an ADHD kid and we maybe don't have the doc the documentation from a doctor, but we can see that that child is hyperactive, then we could qualify that kid. Does that require consent from, from the, the parent? parent? Yes. Okay. Yes. So. So they've made it to tier three, and there's paperwork to go along with that, and it what happens yes. at that point. So we ask for documentation. We never deny a referral, but mm -hmm. we do like to have data. So everything is data-driven. 
and once we have data collected on that student then if they're still not making progress then at that point they would get a referral gathered and turn it into the Wednesday referral meeting. Um, I know we're a very transient district, not as bad as some surrounding us, but still pretty bad. But how, how can a kid make it to f maybe fourth grade and f just now be qualifying? And don't play the COVID card. So, I mean, very, various reasons really I mean a teacher may think oh I can work with this kid and get them where they need to be and then as they work or progress maybe they go to the next grade level um, you know they may have referred them and maybe they didn't qualify because some of our students are very if they're very low they're globally they're globally low learners and they don't qualify for SPED so that could that could be a reason so there's various reasons for that it, is, is it a months long prog, prog I'm sorry, <laughs> lost my word. That happens when you're my age. Process. process, thank you. Is it a months long process or is it a years, a year long no, process? it's not a year pro process, but we do have 45 school days. Sure. And then if a student is absent three or more days, we can add days to that evaluation. Right, sure, okay. But with the numbers, it, it is taking us about 45, right. it's taking and us about 45. Please understand, I'm asking questions that I get asked often. Right, right. So I understand. I'm yes. using you tonight to seek the answers, but I have heard nothing but good things about your evaluation process and how much more efficient it has been this year and most of last year compared to previous years. And so I, I know good things are happening with you guys. Yes. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for taking my question. Absolutely. Anyone else? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm gonna be the elephant in the house. <laughs> Evaluation, uh, kids, uh, ethnic background, numbers. How do we determine if a kid needs to be in special education? How do we make that determination as a teacher, sure. And, and is it because they can't keep up in the class, or they trouble to the classroom, or well, I mean, it's, it's a multitude. They don't of, just don't right. want to mess with the kid because of you know behavioral problems. You know what is it? I mean, I've I've talked to parents that have kids that. They say, well, why is my kid in special education? And sometimes, can it be that we misdiagnose kids who are intelligent but can't sit still in a class because they can move faster than the other kids and then they get kind of antsy and want to move around the classroom and be disruptive? in that aspect, but how do we make that final, I know this kid needs to be in special education, right. I'm determined. And, and that's really made by a committee of knowledgeable people who know that child, that's the administrator on campus, the teacher, the parent is also a part of that, that team, the special educator, and all the evaluators that contributed to that evaluation. So, I mean, and our evaluators use research-based um, instruments to assess the students. So we're really looking at how do they compare to their other similar age peers. Um, so that decision is not taken lightly, but that ARD committee ultimately makes that decision. So that committee makes a decision based upon their knowledge of they use data and how the child is performing in the classroom and they agree on goals and objectives that the child will work on and what specially designed instruction does that child need. And they make that decision, yes sir. Based on the formal assessment. Formal assessment that's completed. So this assessment is made through classroom behavior? Well, um, Classroom behavior is one aspect that an LSSP would look at. 
but an, a diagnostician is also completing cognitive assessment, looking at their intellectual ability and their academic achievement, and also their adaptive behavior. So we're looking at all aspects. And we might be looking at speech as well, and communication. Ms. So Rudy, you did make a point that the parent is involved with the decision. Absolutely, the parent's they're, involved in the entire invited process. To the yard Not meeting. only is the teacher filling out a rating scale, the parents are filling out rating scales as well. We want to really capture the whole child, just not how the child's conducting at school and performing at school. So, on the average, how many kids that you qualify for special, special ed in a year or two now, they are way past special ed. They, they not doing the things that they were diagnosed for when they was diagnosed with special ed? Well, we do, we do have children that eventually we do dismiss, but that's again an ARD committee decision. If they're doing well and passing their STAR assessment, you know, the data leads us to believe they don't need us anymore, that's great. And we, have, and we also dismiss a lot of students who re currently receive speech therapy services, and, and they don't need us anymore. So that, that's a good thing. That's what we really want to see happen. And what the modifications that are afforded to the child are designed to do is to assist them and to help them. And generally... Until they learn to read, and then if they right. don't need us... Right. Mm -hmm. But the, the stigma of special education always follows them throughout their education career. Well... I think special ed has changed a lot throughout the years and it's much more accepted that a child has a disability, whether it's through special ed or 504. I mean, my own child has a disability and he's in college now. So I think it just depends on what supports are out there and you know, colleges are much more accepting of children, even children with intellectual disabilities. They have an opportunity now to go to college. So I think the stigma is kind of going away that was there years ago. And Mr. Sampson, those students also are reevaluated every three, three years, years, and we do an annual meeting every year. So they're, all of that information is really looked at every year. Okay. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. All right. We will now move to agenda item eight, action items, consideration of the consent agenda. We have so, one more. Oh, well, we have I, one more report. No, I forgot that one because there's <laughs> nothing here for me to look at. Ah, okay. so I'm just just saying. We have one more superintendent. We are going to take a three minute recess. While the next group gets up, that'll be Ms. Garcia, Mr. Clem, and I don't know if Dr. McCauley, if you're going to join them. Anyone else? Floor is yours. Good evening, President Clem, board members, and Dr. O'Brien. Tonight, we'd like to present to you an overview of our district needs. Um, in reviewing the needs information that we're providing to you this evening, um, I just want to note that it's inclusive of every department or service of the district. And this information was gathered with the assistance, the assistance of various departments. So from career and technology education, technology, transportation, fine arts, athletics, growth-based and program-based needs, safety and security, and also facility and condition assessment. We'll start by talking about our facility condition assessment. So during the latter part of last year, 2022, the district hired LEN as our third uh, Lockwood Andrews and Noonan, LAN, as our third party consultant uh, to complete a facilities condition assessment. They reviewed 34 district assets, 20 buildings, 25 uh, years or older was a criteria that we used, 1,700 building systems, uh, approximately 17, uh, 700 deficiencies were identified. And from this assessment, they've provided the, the district with a detailed report. That report, um, I'd also like to mention that. Um, again, only the, the facilities that were 25 years and older received the assessment. 
Now we know there are more facilities than that, and so information gathered from the other facilities came um, uh, in cooperation with other departments across the district. So our current, um, LAN is our current consultant and program manager of the 2019 bond. They were able to provide us with an expedited report and um, denoting the identified de deficiencies and needs. So now as we're going into uh, different considerations for the departments that um, you know we received feedback on, um, what we're gonna do is just talk about considerations relating to the facility needs. Um, for career technical education, um, certainly want to take into consideration the increase in student enrollment in our academies and beyond. Uh, changing industry standards, we always want to use the support of our advisory committees to keep us at the cutting edge of preparing our students. And so we have to make sure that our facilities are um, in line with the work that students are gonna have in the future. Uh, college partnerships, and we're all familiar with how we continue to provide dual credit opportunities for our students. Emerging industries, preparing students for jobs that uh, are soon to come on board. We wanna make sure that our students are prepared and able to enter into the workforce. Any gaps are in the skilled labor workforce, workforce certification opportunities. Uh, college and career readiness, of course, is very important for our students in CTE. Uh, we wanna make sure that they're not only in a program of study, but they can take the certification test to be hireable upon exiting our system here in Goose Creek. And then also looking at new facilities and equipment needs based on some of those uh, program needs that we have to meet industry standards. Moving on to some of the technology needs that were identified for the district. Um, and some of these, again, are do, uh, due to, you'll see the, the repeating item there, increased student enrollment, right? That affects pretty much everything in the district. And so increased student enrollment, uh, safety and security needs as well, new technology, cybersecurity has been uh, at the forefront recently, uh, equipment replacement schedules, um, and also new TEA requirements there. As far as transportation, um, again, you'll see some of that overlap. Again, increased student enrollment, safety and security equipment replacement, new technology, vehicle replacement schedules, maintenance equipment replacement, and also certification and regulation mandates. As we're moving on to fine arts, you'll see that fine arts and athletics are pretty similar. Um, these are just considerations that uh, we are we put into place. Instrument replacement schedules, uniform replacement schedules for our various programs, and also new facilities and equipment. Um, going on to athletics, similar as stated before, considerations of equipment replacement schedules, uh, new facilities and replacement facilities and uniform replacement schedules as well. As I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, um, one, of the, one of the big items that um, our district has had to deal with is growth-based needs and program-based needs. And so the needs identified are due to increased pre-K enrollment, increased uh, overall student enrollment, uh, vertical alignment uh, with P16, and then a current and future college partnerships to be considered, educational program opportunities, and then also college and career readiness. And moving on to safety and security needs uh, that were identified, also due to upcoming new TEA facility uh, requirements that are uh, at the forefront, increased student enrollment, changing industry standards, uh, police department needs, uh, increase of district square footage, affects this as well, new technology opportunities, and then our safety audits that are done on a yearly basis as well. So during our last board meeting, we appreciate your support um, in approving us to form a committee involving community members uh, to discuss these facility and district needs. Um, these meetings will be starting very soon and we will task the committee uh, with providing feedback and perspective based on the student uh, needs that are outlined in accordance to our district mission and vision. Uh, we hope as a result of those committees, we can come back to you all uh, with some data um, to inform you um, of what the thoughts of the committee were um, and any questions that they may have had or any salient points that we need to bring to you uh, for your consideration on guidance for next steps. Evening. Do you have any questions? The information concerning dates that we received last meeting is that still?
pretty much what we're going to follow? Yes, that's yes, correct. Sir. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. And now we will arrive at action items, consideration of the consent agenda. Action item 8A, one, district and campus improvement plans, DIPs and CIPs. Uh, number two, donation from Goose Creek Memorial Band Booster Club. Number three, innovative courses as presented. Number four, board policy GKA, local, community relations conduct on school premises regarding drones. Number five, contract with Sweet Southern Sound for professional sound lighting video services for all high school graduation ceremonies. Number six, award of CSP for meat, food processing supplies, equipment, and other grocery items. Number seven, final option to extend CSP for fencing materials, installation, and related items. Number eight, ratification of amendment to the Borson Manisman Pipe U.S. Inc. Agreement, number 1684, for a limitation on appraised value of property for school district maintenance and operation taxes. And number nine, tax refunds. Administration would recommend approval of the consent agenda items. Would anyone like to pull an item for individual consideration or ask any questions? Yes, number four. Anybody else? All right, then I would seek a motion concerning one, two, three, five through nine. I'll move to approve. I have a motion for Mrs. Guy and a second for Mrs. Barat Timms to approve consent agenda items one, two, three, and five through nine. Any discussion? All in, fe uh, fever. All in favor, please raise your hand. I see six, four, and zero against. The motion passes. Uh, item four, Mr. Renteria. I was just wondering why we're, uh, are we updating this policy? Are we having problems with parents on campuses or what is, what is the issue here? It's mostly concerning the use of personal drones and taking pictures of our facilities without prior authorization. And or students or things of that nature. But we have the team here that brought the recommendations for uh, modifying this uh, board policy. The board policy was dated and uh, they're wanting to bring it up with current needs uh, to meet safety needs of our school district. Uh, Mr. Marquez, you wanna start off? Good evening, everyone. Uh, so the board policy is just a local update so that we can put the framework into a process for educational side and the non-educational operation side. There's a lot of stuff going on, so putting things like safety plans, understanding uh, the requirements for flying drones. Uh, Is somebody flying area. drones in our school district? Uh, there I was mean, a approval. I mean, have we been having problems yeah. with that? I mean, no, I just, no, we got a request from the Education Foundation. One of the teachers submitted a, a grant for some, some small drones to teach for their students. And so when we started looking at it, that we really didn't have a policy or guidelines wrapped around that. And so that's what spurred this, hey, we probably need to have some instructional guidelines wrapped around it as well as non-instructional. And to do that, we, needed, we felt we needed to have board policy updated that talked about drones. And so we worked with the yes. CT department along with uh, the safety and security department to on the non-instructional side, we have contractors that use it for construction projects. We also use it in our facilities planning and construction department. Athletics uses them, fine arts uses them. Um, and so drones are, are pretty frequently used across the district. And so we need to make sure that if you're flying a drone in our district's boundaries that we have a documentation for that. On the instructional side, there's also some parameters in place where the teachers have to take approximately an hour drone safety class, no matter if you're a classroom teacher or a coach. Um, and then for our contractors, we just have to know that they are taking aerial footage of any of our facilities, especially considering that we have a municipal airport in the area. And so we had to seek some guidance for that as well, just to make sure we're not interfering with any of their uh, flight signals that they need. Our law enforcement also uses drones occasionally. Yes, thank you, thank you, yes they do. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I'd seek a motion concerning item four. So moved. To approve. Accept, uh, action item four. The motion is to approve. To approve. Okay. I'll second. I have a motion from Mr. Renteria and a second from Mrs. Guy to approve uh, consent agenda item number four. Any further discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. 
see six four zero against motion passes future board agenda items we're going to is that the date for the call the election the deadlines next month right so we'll do that in the February meeting the governance camp is coming up first part of March and if you've never been it's in Galveston and there it's really a very different conference than the other ones we go to each year and other than walking down the stairs at the convention center I highly recommend it right yeah and our next regular board meeting is February 6th and just for the board's information the executive team does go to midwinter conference the last three days of January is that six February 6 8 okay nothing will interfere with that right okay cool all right anything else concerning those items future board can we get an update on the situation about bullying and also the Special Olympics that you know we haven't heard anything about either one of them in a long time can we well the bullying is a quarterly report so you'll get a report once per quarter that's fine but on the Olympics situation I think you'll hear about that in the near future in regards to school meeting okay and in keeping with what he said about bullying can we discuss a board policy for bullying or is that something we can you know we can always discuss policy I would like to do that just the same way we're discussing this other policy yep absolutely thanks I got that all right or anything else all right the board will now recess into a closed session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act Texas government code sections five five one point zero seven one seven two seven three seven four seven five seven six eight two eight three eight four and or eight seven no action will be taken while the board is in closed meeting time is 7 49 p.m. perfect 9 25 and no decisions were made while the board was in closed session we are now under action item e consideration of personnel dr. O'Brien yes administration brings before the board this evening five teacher elections and resignations and retirements as presented for the board's approval I'll move to approve I have a motion from mrs. guy in a second from mrs. Brock Thames to approve elections resignations and retirements as presented any discussion all in favor please raise your hand seeing six four and zero against motion passes there's one administrative election for proposal Shaniqua rice as educational diagnostician administration recommends approval I have a motion from mrs. Brock Thames and a second from mrs. guy to approve the diagnostician as presented any discussion all in favor please raise your right hand just seeing if you were listening six to zero motion passes administration has one further recommendation that the board would consider I move to accept the superintendent's recommendation to terminate the probationary contract of teacher Terry Scott effective at the end of the 2323 school year in the best interest of the district and authorize the superintendent to send such notices as necessary to effectuate second I have a motion and a second from from mrs. guy in a second room mr. Renteria and you heard it any discussion all in favor please raise your hand seeing six four and zero against motion passes that will bring us to our adjournment thank you very much it's 927 first meeting of the year 23 all right that was